welcome to this virtual roundtable where we will be discussing some of the key data that emerged from this year's San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting. I'm Hope Brugo, Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I'm joined today by two expert leaders in the field of breast cancer and great colleagues, Dr. Jennifer Litton from the Andy Anderson Cancer Center and Dr. Joe Chen from the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thanks for joining me today. Now we're going to talk about a really interesting uh, set of presentations at San Antonio that I think really do have direct implications for our clinical practice on Monday. And this is the use of genomic tests and uh, to, in some of the studies, KI-67, in order to try and inform us about how to treat our patients who have higher risk node positive disease. The RxFonder trial presented its first data. Kevin Kalinsky uh, presented this information looking at patients who have one to three positive nodes and a lower recurrence score randomized to chemotherapy and endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy alone. And then the ADAPT trials from the West German Study Group trial looked at patients who had zero to three positive nodes and tried to use the uh, neoadjuvant exposure to three weeks of endocrine therapy and uh, KI-67 response, as well as the recurrent score to try and determine whether adjuvant endocrine therapy or potentially preoperative chemotherapy uh, would be a better approach. And then lastly, we had a little bit of an update on the chemotherapy arm of the alternate trial, which randomized uh, postmenopausal women to endocrine, different endocrine therapies. And then in patients who didn't have a great KI-67 response after four to 12 weeks, uh, they actually went on to receive chemotherapy and she looked at uh, Cynthia Ma presented data on PCR. Uh, so Jennifer, do you want to tell us a little bit about Rx Bonder? Sure, so Rx Bonder uh, is a trial sponsored by SWOG, uh, randomized patients who had one to three positive lymph nodes and a recurrence score by Oncotype DX of zero to 25. And um, what was really interesting and still debating as we speak is uh, in the group that was postmenopausal, there was really no benefit for chemotherapy in this group. And I think likely to be very practice changing uh, to, to, uh, for patients to not have to have chemo. But what remains very controversial is that in the premenopausal women, we were not seeing that same, uh, we were seeing actual differences uh, in those uh, zero to 25. Um, so at, at this point, it, it did continue to show a difference if you were premenopausal, but postmenopausal women look like they could avoid chemotherapy. Yeah, really fascinating information. I know we'll see a lot more data on this uh, going forward, including which endocrine therapy regimens were used in the patients getting hormone therapy alone since premenopausal women were included. What about the ADAPT trials, Joe? So the ADAPT trials were actually quite elegant. Um, th this is a trial that uh, took patients who had hormone receptor positive disease and um, for those who had oncotype, they did base-like oncotype and KI-67s on everybody. And for those that had oncotypes between 12 and 25, they gave them a three-week course of preoperative hormone therapy, and that could be either tamoxifen or AI. And then um, after th three weeks, they repeated the KI-67. And for those that did not drop their KI-67 to 10% or lower, they were... Um, they were eligible for the chemo portion of this uh, trial where they could be randomized into a, a neoadjuvant chemo trial. And then for the, the, the patients who did drop their KI-67 and the patients who had recurrent scores under 12, they were able to just stay on hormone therapy. And what they showed was that their five-year invasive disease-free survival was quite excellent. Um, and and you know, I, I think when we put this in context with our expander, you know, which is suggesting that at least in premenopausal women, chemotherapy is beneficial um, and adapt where a third of patients were premenopausal and about a quarter um, were node positive. There may be a subset within this group that will do well without chemotherapy. Um, it's hard to know, and, and I, I agree with um, Jennifer that based on our expander, chemotherapy seems to benefit these young women. But I think that question of how much of this is ovarian suppression um, 
versus direct chemo benefit is still unknown and unclear and not addressed and answered in these trials. Yeah, it's really interesting. And that was a great uh, summary. The alternate trial, which you know took patients who didn't have a KI-67 response between four and 12 weeks and then went on to give chemotherapy, showed a very low PCR rate in the patients who had ER positive disease, were postmenopausal and had this low KI-67, uh, had a no lack of KI-67 mm -hmm. response, which is really fascinating. You know, this is a different biology of disease, and we clearly need to improve our therapy in the hormone receptor positive setting uh, in patients who have low proliferative disease. Where are you going to take this to the clinic on Monday, Jennifer? So I think that I feel very comfortable for patients um, who are postmenopausal and have a uh, a zero to 25 recurrence score that we can forego, chemo, uh, forego chemotherapy. For the premenopausal women, uh, so far, I think that this data doesn't completely support um, withholding chemotherapy. It's going to be a conversation discussing this percent benefit. And I think the study that has to be done is giving everyone do, doing this in premenopausal women with ovarian suppression and see. But I think that just like uh, Joe said, uh, this, these trials neither answered that question or gave us the tools to answer that question. So I think that's probably the next likely study if we're going to really find out that answer. This is really interesting data, and I think how you know it's nice to hear how you're going to apply it to the clinic. You know, it's also we use one to three positive nodes and four or more positive nodes because we do staging this way. But in fact, in these trials, the number of patients with three positive nodes was small, and it did appear that they had a worse outcome. So do you think we should be using this one to three nodes in sort of a, a global decision, or should it really be based on the number of nodes? I think you really still need to take into consideration the clinical pathologic data in combination with oncotype and other molecular tests. Um, certainly in patients who have three nodes, they were very much underrepresented um, in this trial and did do worse. And so I, I would pause a little bit um, for the three nodes. I, I think for one and two, I feel very comfortable in the postmenopausal patients and, and premenopausal, you know, I think this data would really lead us to think about chemotherapy. I think one thing to add there is that this trial did have an amendment uh, in the course of it where originally N1, if it was microscopic, was allowed. And there was a large number of women that may have entered because they did change the inclusion to exclude N1 microscopic. So I, I think it'll be really interesting when we see this written up, the percentage of N1 that was really microscopic too. I think that the bottom line is that in postmenopausal women, we can spare a lot of people chemotherapy, um, maybe the three nodes, not so much. Uh, for premenopausal women, the role of ovarian suppression is incredibly important to understand, particularly in patients who have low risk clinical pathologic features, you know, one node or microscopic involvement of a node, and not all of those patients require chemotherapy based on this data. Thanks very much.